Jesus. young lady Well, you were Carol one. I mean, you were stuck. Did it stop now? Yes. Amen. I've been taught, I was trained to do exegetical preaching, work my way through a passage beginning to end, and it's what I've always done, it's what I love, and so this morning I'm not going to do that. If we're going to do something else. A couple of weeks ago, probably, I want to say like the third week of June, pastor was doing a message in the Gospel of Mark. And he hit on part of a conversation between Peter and the disciples. And it was amazing to me. I mean, God grabbed my attention on it. And from that time until this, I've been looking at that concept, the, the conversations between uh, God and the disciples, and in particular between God and Peter, our otter. And so I want us to move through the New Testament this morning, just specifically looking at some of those conversations between God and Peter. We observed one of them already this morning when Dirk read for us the passage out of Luke 5. We see the call to the disciples and he comes to them as he does many times by the sea, right? And he walks up to them and talks to them about the whole fishing experience and what they had been doing and cast your nets out. Well, Peter says, we've been doing that, Lord. Why would we do that again? But if you say so, I'll do it. And so he does. And we all know the result from then. And that miracle on the sea, Peter immediately fell down at the feet, dropped to his knees, and worshipped the living God. Because he recognized right away that God was at work, that it was a God thing. And so that is the beginning of Peter's education, Peter's call, but also his growth, his walk with the living God, if you will. And so as we move through the passage this morning, that's exactly what we want to take a glimpse at, see what we can learn from those snippets of conversation between the Apostle Peter and his God. Because like Megan and Bailey both attested to this morning, this is far more than just a religion. It is about a relationship with a living God. This is alive. It's real. It's different. I've been in the Word on this particular subject for a while. Why? Because God got a hold of my heart that morning when Pastor was preaching. And Do you see this, Doug? 
This is what I have for you. This is what I want for you. And he wants it for you as well. So before we get rolling this morning, let's take just a minute and walk into the throne room. Walk in boldly and ask the Lord to reveal to us what he has for us this morning. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that you loved us enough to come down from heaven to take on flesh almighty God in flesh for my sake for our sake for all eternity you loved us that much Father as we open your word this morning may we hear from you hide me behind the cross Father Make us more like your son. Change us from the inside out. Help us to love you more. We ask, Lord, that you would give me the words to speak, that you will focus us, that the Holy Spirit will move in us to make us calm of heart and mind, that we might hear your voice. We ask all these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. So the first of our passages this morning, if you want to turn to Matthew 14, we're going to look at the beginning. All right. Now, I've had all kind of people praying about the technology issue. Is it the operator error, pastor? Yep. or not conversations with an otter I was first exposed to this idea this concept in college Tim LaHaye a lot of you are probably familiar with him with the uh, book series that he wrote but long before he started doing uh, fiction based on things to come and time prophecy he had written a number of books on temper uh, temper That's the way Dr. LaHaye described it and all kinds of psychologists and people before him. But that's the phrase that he used. When uh, the book was written by Dr. Smalley, he decided there's a way to get that to stick and do a little better. Hopefully that helps. Um, And that is to attach an animal to it. And so the first one of our character traits is the lion. He's the choleric. He's all about dominance. He's an extrovert. He's an extroverted personality. His strengths are visionary, practical, productive, strong-willed, independent, decisive. He's a leader. You pick out a lion that quickly, right? They stand out. Now, I will also tell you, if any of you took the quiz you have a total number. If you add those up, like it tells you on the sheet, you'll come to a number at the bottom. One of those typically will be higher than the others. In some cases, a lot higher than the others. That's your dominant trait. That's your dominant temperament. Your personality leans that way. Most of us are more than one of them. 
most of us have parts of several of them in, in many cases. Uh, and you'll see that as you work your way through it. The weaknesses for the lion, he's unemotional, he's domineering, he's self-sufficient, he's unforgiving, sarcastic, he can be cruel and cold. The second one is the beaver. The beaver is uh, from the melancholy group. That was how it was first defined. They're all about compliance. Compliance in others and compliance in themselves. They're rule followers. They're introverted. They're analytical. They're self-disciplined. They're industrious. They're sacrificing. They're organized. They're aesthetic. Their weaknesses can be, they can be self-centered. They can be negative, unsociable, revengeful, touchy, moody, even critical at times. The third would be the phlegmatic. They're all about steadiness. They're introverted as well. They're on that left side of this. Their strengths tend to be, they're calm, they're easygoing, they're dependable, they're quiet, they're objective, they're diplomatic, they're humorous. The animal that Dr. Smalley put with them was the golden retriever. Their weaknesses would be they could be selfish, stingy, fearful, unmotivated, indecisive, a worrier, a procrastinator. But the golden retriever tends to be an incredible friend. And then there's my people. You know who you are. You otters in the group. Raise your hand if you're an otter. Atta way. Welcome. <laughs> the otters, they're where the party's at. We're where the party's at. <laughs> Our strengths tend to be we're outgoing, we're responsive, we're compassionate, we're friendly, we're talkative. No, go on. Seriously? Don't you say a word. <laughs> Enthusiastic, warm. Their, their negative traits tend to be they're undisciplined, they're unproductive, they exaggerate, they're egocentric, they're unstable. That's the typical otter. Now, where is he going with this? What in the world does that have to do with Peter and our passage this morning? It has everything to do with it, and I'll show you why. The first one of those, our lion, that's Paul. That's Paul all over, right? When, when Paul was upset with some of his traveling companions, did he just forgive and get, forget and move on? No. No, he had a hard time forgiving. He was struggling with that whole thing. And, and was Paul visionary? Was Paul afraid to step into a situation and say what he thought? Absolutely not. Paul's a lion. The second one of our friends, uh, they're actually, I've read a number of different ones, but the two that stand out are Moses and Thomas. And I'll, I'll do the simple one just for time's sake. You see where it says negative under the weaknesses for our beaver? They don't call him Doubting Thomas for nothing. Okay? The third one, our golden retriever, Abraham. Abraham's a great example of the golden retriever trait. And then we come to Peter. Peter is for sure an otter. From the very beginning, Peter's going to say what he thinks as soon as it hits his brain. And sometimes it hadn't even got that far yet, and he's talking. That's Peter, and that's us otters. That's what we do, right? We're going to tell you. And so Peter is that particular individual. But I want to say something to you. God created us the way we are. God created Peter. And I got news for you. God called Peter to be an apostle. But he also called Paul. He also called Thomas. He didn't say, well, your personality is A. You're a lion, so you don't have to obey this stuff. You just obey the ones that fit you. No. That's not what he tells us. Well, you're an introvert, so don't you worry about the Great Commission. That's all good. No, that's not what he tells us. God is greater than our personality traits. And my God, your God, 
created us the way we are, and he has a plan for our lives. And one of the things, as I move through these conversations, the amazing thing, the blessing that is in all of it, is the fact that God used him, worked through him, worked in him for his purposes. Amen? And so this morning, as we look at this together, we find ourselves at the Sea of Galilee. And there's a couple of things about this. This is about the size of one of the Finger Lakes up in New York. It's roughly eight or so miles across at the widest part. Some 16, 13 miles long, I think. I have that right from memory. My old man brain, I don't trust, but. And these guys are out on the sea. They just come from the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus tells them to go on out ahead, and he goes in prayer. And it's where we come into the passage, and I want you to think about this. They're three, three and a half miles off. One of the Gospels gives us the distance. And it's be, the watch that they tell us puts them out there between three and six in the morning. And then, for good measure, the Lord throws in a storm as well. And so now they're out at sea, somewhere between three and six in the morning, three and a half miles from shore, and a, in a storm. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Okay. Now what's the first thing that Jesus says to them? Look with me in Matthew 14. When the disciples saw him, verse 26, walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Not an unreasonable response, is it? Can you imagine? Put yourself in their shoes for just a minute and tell me how you would have responded. Think about those circumstances. And so, then the otter steps in. Now, does this seem like a reasonable thing to say in this circumstance that I just painted to you, that Matthew painted for us? Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you. Lord, can I have your permission to get out of the boat? Has he lost his mind? What's he thinking? Can I get out of the now, I'll give him this. As a fellow otter, at least he was smart enough to ask the Lord's permission before he just stepped out of the boat. Right? Think about that kind of circumstance. It says to you, brain, I think what we want to do here is get out into the water. Classic. You again. <laughs> so, he's going to keep... Here. We just might as well put him on the platform here in a minute, right? <laughs> I did not do it, I promise. I love you, Tim. Yeah. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Can we stop for just one second? Did you hear what I said? Peter got out of the boat and walked on water. Wow. Is our God amazing? Peter got out of the boat and went to Jesus. Impulsive? You bet. Well thought out? Probably not. Did he want to be where Jesus was? Probably. Bid me come to you. But scripture records for us, he looked at the wind. He saw the waves. 
and he doubted. He started to say. Now, I'll give him credit for this. And I'll tell you this, I hope I would be faithful enough, I would be quick enough, and I would trust enough to say, save me, Jesus. Here's another, just almost like an aside, the way Matthew records it. And they got off the water, into the boat, and the storm stopped. That quick. Done. Right? How great is your God? How awesome must it have been to see it all? To at one moment be in fear for your life in the midst of a sea in what amounted to a dinghy in our standards. To watch one of your friends get out of the boat and walk to Jesus on top of the water. Start to sink. Jesus rescue them. They walk to the boat, and the storm stops. Wow. How great is our God. We step from there into Matthew 16. There's two parts to this piece, and in Matthew 16, we'll see them both, and we'll ask ourselves another question. Actually, two. There's a confession and there's a rebuke. In the confession, he says a simple question to the disciples. We'll pick up in verse 13. When Jesus had come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. There's a question that we have to ask ourselves. The first question, back on the Sea of Galilee, when Peter walked on the water, was why so little faith? Peter is asked that question, right? But it's not the only time that Jesus asked them that question. The time they were wondering where they were going to get bread, and Jesus said to them, you just saw me feed the 5,000. You think I can't give you bread? This is what you're worried about? Or the other time when they were in the boat and Jesus was asleep. Of course he was. And they're thinking the thing's going to swamp and go down because they're taking on water really fast and they wake Jesus up and he said oh you have little faith so the the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is our faith great or is it little is our faith stagnant or is it growing but also we need to ask ourselves who do we say Jesus is is he our God Is he our savior? Is he our friend? Is he our help? Is he our strength? Is he our joy? Is he our peace? Does he have the answers of life? Is he the great physician? Who do we say Jesus is? Now, you're probably wondering, who's going to speak up, right? Well, Peter's going to speak up, of course. When you look at it, when I started researching this, Peter spoke to Jesus three or four times more than number two on the list. Thanks to the wonders of modern Bible software, I found that out. And Jesus spoke to him over 500 different times in 68 or 78 verses. And so the conversation, of course, picks up again. And he says, 
Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of God. I'd originally intend to go through the balance of the passage, but for time's sake, I'll stop there this morning and ask you just one or two simple questions. You've got to remember something. In that particular circumstance, there was still up in the air as to who this really was. John the Baptist, it's recorded for us in Matthew 11, even said when Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John, John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? He was totally unsure, and part of the reason he was unsure, it's in total contrast, MacArthur said, to their preconceived views of the Messiah, that the Messiah would be ridiculed with impunity, not to mention persecuted and executed. That whole concept was inconceivable in that day and time to those disciples. They had been waiting for the Messiah to come because they were sure he was going to be the king. And if he was the king, he was going to rescue them. But that's not what he came to do. And he had been telling them that from the very beginning of his ministry. But it hadn't necessarily sunk in yet. But when Peter responded, thou art the Christ, Jesus knew that that was from God. God had given that to Peter. And it's encouraging. I don't know about you, but for me, probably because I'm a bit of an otter, it was encouraging to me that Peter, with all his failings, with all of his difficulties, God gave him that bit of knowledge in his heart and in his mind that said to him, this is my son. Whoa. Have you experienced God like that? Do you know him for yourself? Has he revealed his truth to you? Has he given you a peace in the heart and mind that allow you to stand up and say, that's my God? Who do you say that Jesus is? Pray that we have the kind of courage that will allow us to stand up for our Lord. But just a few minutes later, we come to Matthew 16, 21. A number, another conversation between Peter and his Lord. And from that time, verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And I told you, they, this was hard. It was difficult for them. That's not at all what they expected the Messiah to do and say, and be. Yet he continued to teach them this hard truth. They weren't ready to hear it. But it's what God had for them then, right? In verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, thou shalt, this shall never happen to you. Did you hear what I said? Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Really? Have you ever done one of those things that you knew partway into it, eh, I really messed up this time? That had to be what Peter was thinking partway through that little experience, right? You know, I really didn't think this out a lot. But you read what he said, it only makes perfect sense. Lord, you can't go and be killed. You're the Messiah. We've been waiting for you for thousands of years. When you stop and think about that situation in that circumstance, Peter wasn't saying anything that probably most of us wouldn't have said. Far be it from you, Lord. We don't want that for you. But what Peter didn't understand is it was God's plan to begin with. Have you ever been there? Have you ever not recognized God's working in your life? Have you ever been praying for relief from a particular circumstance or situation that God, it turned out, was using all along? 
The apostles might not have known it, but it was for their own good that he was going to go to the cross. It was for our good he was going to go to the cross. And so when Jesus responded to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, it was for Peter's good. It was for the apostles' good. It was for our good that he said it. And there are two things he says in that that should get our attention. First of all, you're a trap. You're a hindrance. You're a snare that may cause me to sin. And second of all, your mind is not on spiritual things. They're on the things of man. In Romans 8, 5, we're told those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. In Philippians 3, he tells us in verses 15 and 16, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained, what we have learned, what we have been given, what God has instilled in our hearts and minds. We move on to the transfiguration. Matthew 17. Now I'm going to do this up on the screen because there are three Gospels that record this for us, and I want you to see the conversations between Peter and Jesus in this circumstance. And you learn a couple things by just working your way through the Gospels side by side. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Just another day at the office, right? Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Over in Luke 9, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they came fully awake, they saw his glory and two men who stood with them. Okay, we had some bad anchovies, right? Something's not right. They're... And what were they doing sleeping again? We think about the scene that they woke to. What that must have been like? What was going through their minds? Would you have been a little speechless? Would have wondered where these two guys came from? If we look in Mark 9, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. A lot of people think that Peter transcribed the book of Mark to Mark uh, to write. Whether that's true or not, Mark records for us they were, first of all, they were terrified, and Peter didn't know what to say. Now, being an otter, that wasn't going to stop Peter. Not knowing what to say isn't necessarily going to keep you from saying something. And Peter, not wanting to let us down, said, Jesus, it's good we're here. I got a plan. If you wish, we can go over here and we'll make a tent for Moses. And I'm thinking over here next to the palm will be one good for Elijah. And then we'll put one up for you. And he was still speaking, Matthew records, when behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, Peter's still laying out his plan for the village, right? He was talking because it was that uncomfortable silence, I suppose. And he, wanted, he didn't know what to say, according to the author of the gospel, so he's just saying something. And God interrupted him. What did he tell him? Listen to my son. Don't talk, listen. Listen to him in whom I am well pleased. 
Back in Luke 9, the 33rd verse, as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. We read all that. But not knowing what he said. He was just talking to talk at that point. We ask ourselves a question. They woke up afraid. They were in the presence of Jesus, but they woke up afraid. Peter just started talking to hear himself talk rather than listen to what Jesus wanted them to do in the given circumstance when he woke up. Turn to John 13. My screen tells me I got to get moving. And so in John 13, we come to that washing of the feet. And Peter didn't want to have any part of this. If you read with me in verse 6, he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Lord, I, my, not my feet. This is embarrassing. You're God. I don't want any part of that. I don't want you washing my feet. I know who you are. Jesus said to him, What I am doing now, you don't understand. But afterward, you will understand. Peter responded, You shall never wash my feet. Peter answered, or Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. How many times have you been in the circumstance where you know you don't understand what God's doing? Will we trust Him? Will we follow Him? No matter what we feel about the circumstance, will we walk with Him? Peter, to his credit, when was told by Jesus, look, if I don't do this, you have no part with me. Peter said, wash it all. <laughs> Get it all, Lord. Typical Peter that's what us otters do. If we go sideways in one area, we're going to overcompensate, mark it down. That's what we do. And Peter said, look, not just my feet, my head, my hands, do it all. Oh, that we all would be like Peter and say, Lord, it's all yours. It's all yours. I don't care what the re consequences may be. I am yours. I don't care how embarrassing it may be. I don't care if you say it, I want it. In John 13, 33, we come to the one that we all know. Jesus tells the disciples... It's time. The last question, do you understand, is going to be put to the test. This one is, will you lay down your life for me? John 13, 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as you are my disciples. If you love me, love, have love for one another. And so Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered and said, will you lay down your life for me? Truly I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Turn over to Luke 22. Luke 22.
Verse 54. They seized him and led him away and bring him, brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Can you imagine what had to be going through his heart and mind? This one that he had walked with for three years, who he'd seen perform miracle after miracle, who he had just told that he would die for, he denied him three times in a very small span. Could there have been a lower point in his life recorded for us in the gospel of Luke that Jesus looked over at Peter and when he looked at him Peter remembered what Jesus had said and Luke records for us that he went out and wept bitterly can you imagine upon this rock I will build my church Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The same man just denied his Savior three times. But I submit to you, would we have done any better in the same circumstance? The amazing thing, in a time when our society will dig up, heaven help you if you would run for public office of any sort. Because if you did something 35 years ago, they will find it, and they will nail you for it. There is no room in our society today for a changed life. There is no room in our society today for us to grow, for us to change. But I tell you this, my God is in a heart-changing business. My God changes lives. My God changes the way we look at people. He rescues hearts. He changes minds. Peter was reinstated. We're told in Luke 24, 34 that he had appeared to Simon. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5, we're told that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. He had already met with Peter. He had already come before him one-on-one. But turn with me. We conclude with John 21. And I'll do this quickly. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. John 21 shows us the heart of our God. He shows us what he wants and has for us. He had already appeared to them a number of times at different places in different circumstances but he comes to some of the apostles back by the sea back where we started and he says to them you got any fish see MacArthur thinks they weren't just out for recreational time they weren't out there to calm their nerves he believes that Peter went back to his old profession. It gives a number of reasons which time precludes me from giving you this morning, but I'll, I'll tell you this. There is evidence to believe what he's saying, but there's a more important point here, and that is this. What Jesus does and tells Peter. What he does is what he always does. He meets needs. He does the miraculous. He does 
what's necessary at the moment. They've been fishing, as usual. I don't understand how they could have made a living doing this, because every time it's recorded in Scripture, they didn't do very well. But nonetheless, let down your nets, right? Go to the other side, because over here is not so good, but this part's great. What? Yeah, go over here. What happened? They filled the nets. One of the awesome little details in this thing, they got to shore, right? Peter being Peter, the impulsive one, John says to him, I think that's Jesus. Out of the boat, gone. You guys take care of it. I got, I got to go talk to Jesus. Right? When they get in there, what's on the grill? Fish. He didn't need their fish. He had fish. He took some of theirs and put it on the grill as well. You know what the interesting part is? The conversation with Peter. That conversation is one of the reasons I love this passage. Just love this passage. Look with me. We'll pick it up. Come have breakfast. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. See, one of the MacArthur's proof texts that he believes that Peter there was being asked, do you love me more than your fishing nets? Do you love me more than your boat? Do you love me more than your old profession? Are you willing to leave it all behind? Do you love me? Peter said, you know I love you, right? That wasn't good enough. Look at the balance of the conversation. Feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved at this point. He said, the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. What's our faith about? Is it religion or is it a relationship? Amen. Do you love me? Not do you go to church. Not do you preach. Not do you teach Sunday school. Not do you witness. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. All the law and the commandments are wrapped up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. When God gave the law, he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. And he wanted them down there so bad that when Moses got angry with the people because they had gone and made an idol and crushed the Ten Commandments, God had them come back up on the mountain and give them to him again and brought them back down. You know what the Ten Commandments are all about? Loving God and loving people. You can take every one of them and put them in one of those two categories. And he showed us that we couldn't do it ourselves through the law. The law taught us that well, I'm not capable. You're not capable. But thank be to God that we serve a mighty God who stepped into time and space on our behalf. Do you love me? The very next thing recorded for us is him telling Peter, here's the death you're going to die. I'm telling you now, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go where you don't want to go, and someone else is going to dress you. You will die on my behalf. He told him that, that he would know the death it would become. But his next words to him were, 
follow me. And Peter, being Peter, turned to John and said, well, what about John? What about him? Does he have to do this? And he said, look, that's between me and John. You do what I called you to do. Follow me. Regardless of what it costs. Listen, if all we have is a set of rules and a religion, then we might as well go home and be done with it. But if we have a God, a living God, a creator of the universe that died in our place to reestablish a relationship that was broken, then he wants to know one thing. Do you love me? And if you do, follow me. That's what it's all about. That's all he wanted Peter to learn. And the next time we see Peter is at Pentecost. And he's preaching one thing and one thing only. Jesus, the Son of God. The time after that we see him is the lame man. And he says, look, I don't have money. But what I have, I'll give to you. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he tells us, the recipe. Add these things. Grow in these things. Mature in these things. This is the same Peter who couldn't open up his mouth without sticking his foot in it. Now God is using to record for us sanctification processes in 1 Peter 1. God's in the life-changing business. The question becomes twofold. What God has stirred my heart over the last three or four weeks and looking at this stuff is simply this. It doesn't matter what your personality bent is. It doesn't matter how God gifted you. He gifted you, and if he gifted you, he gifted you for a reason, as he gifted me for a reason. The reason he doesn't take us home at the moment of salvation is he has a job for us to do. He wants us to show him we love him. And the way we show him we love him is by living that love out in front of a world that desperately needs what he so graciously gave us. Think about that for just one moment and tell me why we aren't out there serving the one we love. Well, I'm not a full-time missionary. I said this to the class this morning. Yes, we are. My mission field is 1120 East College Avenue. It's called your building center. Your mission field is where God has you. Where does he have you right now? Because that's where he wants to use you. If he didn't want to do that, he'd have you somewhere else. It has to be real. It has to be more. It was the whole point of what he said and did with Peter. Do you love me? We need to love him, and because we love him, we need to love others. We need to love one another. We need to come alongside one another. It's got to be real in a life, in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Father, if if it please you, draw us, Father, ever closer to yourself. Change us from the inside out. Make us over into the image of our dear Savior, your Son. Father, help us to be Jesus to a world that desperately needs what we've been given. May it be real in our hearts and minds. May our hearts be so filled with our love for you that it spills out of us. We can't control it. We can't contain it. That it spills upon everyone we come in contact with. The love of God in our hearts so stirs us that regardless of our weaknesses, regardless of our failings, we 
We want to be with you. We want to be more like you. Change us, Father. Use us for your honor, your glory. Draw souls into your kingdom because of lives changed, hearts changed, believers walking in the love of God. Make it real here in Belfont, Pennsylvania. We ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Pastor Aaron.